This is Mike Domish, host of the Everyday Mindfulness Show, and you're listening to Chasing Dreams with Amy J. Welcome to Chasing Dreams Podcast with Amy J. Amy believes that realizing a life without regrets is achieved by taking chances, chasing your dreams, making moves, and overcoming your doubts. The Chasing Dreams podcast will help you overcome life's obstacles, believe in your potential, and inspire you to face your fears. And now here's the woman who is passionately pursuing her dreams, Amy J. Hey, Dream Chasers. This is Amy J. And thank you so much for tuning in to episode 89. I mean, let that sink in for a little bit. 89, which is ridiculous to me. Well, I brought on a special guest today who is an author and writer and has put together a book that I think is very important. And I want to talk about that today. So let me introduce you guys to Mike Domish, who is on a mission to create a culture of consent and respect through the Date Safe Project. As one of the leading voices for helping children, young adults, parents, educational institutions, and the U.S. military discuss dating, sexual decision-making, consent, and sexual assault. Mike speaks to tens of thousands of people yearly around the world, providing positive how-to skill sets and helpful insights for romantic relationships, sexual intimacy, and being safer. Mike is also the host of the Everyday Mindfulness Show, so you dive into fun, thought-provoking, and engaging conversations on everyday mindfulness, from meditation to spirituality to personal passions to success and failure to relationships and so much more. The show features special guests and a unique cast of over 70 individuals who are known to stop by and join the vibrant conversation each week. And he's bringing some conversation to this show today. Mike, how are you doing today? I am doing wonderful, Amy. Thank you for asking. Now, Mike, you have an interesting background in that you're an author uh, of this book and the book is called, can I kiss you? And I wanted to talk Thank you about for asking, this. by the way. Yeah. I mean, you, <laughs> it's, it's such an important book and I don't think I realized it from the title and from the title, I was like, I don't know, I don't know what this book is about, but you know, in, in beginning to read it, I was like, this is not a, a conversation that is being had today. Do you find that that is the, the case? That is exactly the, re the reaction we get when people dive into the book. And what we love is people dive into it going, oh, my gosh, I would like right away jumped into that first exercise, which, you know, in chapter one is the body language challenge. Mm -hmm. And people are like, oh, I was taking the challenge. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I do that. And oh, my gosh, I do that. And suddenly people are like, oh, my gosh, I want to keep reading. And that's what we wanted. We want to create a conversation that no one's having that affects all of our relationships. And that was the whole goal of that book was to transform our culture and how it views sexual decision making. Now, just to be clear, is this something new that's only happened in the recent past? I know millennials get a bad rap and, you know, today's society and all that, but is this actually one of those cases or is this something that's been going on for a while? There is nothing new about sexual violence. Mm. It's been around for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, actually. It has been present. The difference is that in the past few decades, we've started to create a safer, not safe yet, but safer environment for survivors to come forward. Therefore, we're hearing a lot more about it because people actually feel safe enough to talk about what happened to them and what somebody did wrong to them, it's, right? It's not their fault this happened. And so we're empowering people. They will say, somebody did something wrong to me and I deserve to be able to have a voice. And they do deserve to have that voice, every survivor. And that's the difference. So now you're hearing survivors where we didn't hear survivors in the past. Yeah, and it's interesting because sexual assault, I believe I've, I've heard this before it's the only crime that the victim is blamed or in mo some cases that is what happens is that something you've also found yeah it is it is one of the only major crimes in the world where many societies turn first to the survivor and say well what did you do did you stop it or did you ask for it i mean ridiculous questions it, the only one right the only question mm -hmm. that should ever be asked if you're going to ask between, let's say, two people, right, that there's an assailant and a survivor. The only question should be to the assailant. Did you ask? Did you respect the answer? Was this person of sound mind and legal age? That's the questions. It should not be anything on the survivor. I mean, think about this. If you were walking on the street 
And this is an old analogy, but it's still true. And you got mugged. And the person said they had a weapon on them. And you said, just take my money, just take my money. And you went to court. Nobody in the right mind would expect it to be okay for somebody to say, well, did you tell them not to mug you? Well, no, I was too scared in the moment. Well, then you must have wanted to be mugged. Mm. I mean, it's just a ridiculous concept. You know, some of you guys listening might be wondering, well, what does this have to do with chasing dreams? And I think it has everything to do with it. I mean, the way we go about society and the way we kind of act, it's the world we're in. You chasing your dreams is hopefully to better the environment that you are in. And this book and what Mike is doing is for that purpose. And so just want to clear that up in case anybody's like, ah, this is kind of an eerie topic. It's a topic that has to be spoken about. And um, I think sometimes well, we don't. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I know I'm jumping a little ahead here, but yeah. here's the easiest way for anybody to think about what does this have to do with chasing dreams? I'm on a dream mission right now. There you I'm go. on a dream mission. And some people will hear the line of work I'm in and go, oh, well, your mission is to end sexual violence or to stop rape. And that's all part of it. That, that's the long term outcome that will happen if my dream happens. Because that's actually not my mission that I'm focused on, but that will happen if my mission takes place. And here's my dream that I'm focused on, that whenever somebody engages in sexual activity or pursues it, it will only be under the auspice of pursuing mutually amazing consensual sexual intimacy. And if every time in the world somebody chose to be sexually active, they would only do it under that guideline. We will not have rape. We will not have sexual assault if, if everyone followed that. Now, I know not everyone will follow that. We have predators and all. But if we could change 90 percent of the world following that, we would drastically transform our culture. Everyone listening, your children would be safer. Your relationships would be better. Sexual intimacy would be better. Uh, your work environment would be 10 times better. Your corporate culture would be 10 times better because all this degradation and gender treatment of mm -hmm. differences would not be there. Because you wouldn't treat people differently based on that. That's part of the element of getting there. And that's the thing I, that drew me to what Mike is doing is because it, it's so easy to kind of go, oh, that's a taboo topic. We don't talk about that. But the truth is, you know, by having these conversations and bringing light to awareness and being mindful of the fact that, hey, maybe we're doing things we don't realize we're doing. No one's accusing you of anything. But there may be some subtle things that you're doing that you don't realize that could be giving off signals or warnings to others. And we just want to help make the environment a better place, a safer place for you, for your children and children's children and so on and so forth. And my, have you found that this is also affecting people not just in regards to sexual intimacy, but maybe a workplace environment, how we treat one another? Absolutely. Think of it this way. So, so our mission, and if you went to our website, it would say creating a culture of consent and respect. Mm -hmm. Now, if you said, does that apply to the workplace? Well, that's a no brainer, right? Because here's an easy test. You ever been in work and heard somebody say to check out what she's wearing? And what they're saying, check out is actually not the clothes. Well, what do you think, Amy? They're normally saying check out. Well, it's definitely not, not the clothes, but it probably not even in a positive manner necessarily. Correct. It's either, it's either the shape or the skin itself, yeah. right? It's either things like cleavage or the form or the figure. And so what are they doing? They're sexualizing the workplace and then blaming her, in this case, a woman in this case, and then blaming the woman in this case uh, for their sexualizing of her by saying, well, that's not appropriate or that should, that's how they'll argue it. Well, they wore that. They must have wanted that attention. Um, they probably looked in the mirror and thought they looked great in that outfit. Just like you looked in the mirror before you left work to think, do I look good in this outfit right. today? But you chose to sexualize their outfit because society taught you that's okay. And, right? and, and people go, well, wow, what is, okay, that's workplace. What does it have to do with creating a safer environment for the whole world? Well, here's the problem. If in the workplace, I am teaching others that we can degrade purely based on gender, which mm -hmm. is what that's doing. Well, how do you think that affects that person at home? And your coworker who you taught that lesson to when you were all laughing about how funny that was and they go home and now treat their partner differently in subtle ways that slowly builds up. It's in every facet of our life and very much so the corporate culture can lead to this at home and everywhere. So, Mike, can I ask a question? So, well, I'm asking a lot of questions, aren't I? But one in particular, how does TV and entertainment movies, how does that play into all this? Well, it definitely plays into it because you want role modeling of the behavior you're seeking. Everybody does, right? If I come up to another person, any human being, and say, well, you try this thing you've never done before. 
they're going to first want to see somebody else has done it. It's just a natural human reaction. All right. So for instance, if I say, do you ask for a kiss? People go, well, no. And I'll say, why not? Well, it ruins a moment. Uh, you could be rejected. I go, hold on. So you've asked, you know this from experience. And they go, well, no. Oh, so it's the assumption of the fear of what will happen, not the reality of what will happen. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem is that people run by their fear of what will happen. Now, here's the irony in this moment. I go, okay, you don't ask for a kiss. You just go for it. Can you still be rejected? Yep. Can it be extremely awkward? Yep. Can it ruin the moment? Yep. So in other words, your current system is setting you up for disaster and you're still not looking for a new system that does it way better and treats everyone with respect. And people go, whoa, I didn't think of it that way. That's what we got to do. We have to shift the paradigm. How can you say to people, we can have a lot of fun at work and not degrade other human beings? And the same could be said for college as well, right? I mean, I have yes. a lot of little brothers and sisters who are graduating high school and about to head into college. And I know, and it, it concerns me, you know, that they'll be at a party or they'll be with friends and somebody will suddenly just, you know, kiss them without their permission, probably maybe stealing their first kiss, you know, in a moment that they did not ask for or consent to. And that's my Here's, concern with, with how things play into it. Absolutely. I mean, take last fall when a political figure makes news for a video that gets out on the bus, right? Mm -hmm. And and that happens. What was amazing after that was how many millions in the country united to discuss how they had been treated in similar fashions in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And until that point, nobody was having it at that multitude of a level of conversation. And it, what it did was it was, a, oh my gosh, are people listening to how much this is happening? Like, because what we tend to do is we tend to focus on the one example in the media instead of saying, how often is this happening? How are we in a culture where this is so frequent? That's a, that, that's a very, very, oftentimes we think that we're, we're, we're safe. We're, we're, we're safe and it won't happen to us, I guess. And I think a lot of us have that mentality that this would never happen to us. For whatever reason, there's no rhyme or reason as to why we think that. It just never happened to me, right? And I think we don't have that these conversations. We because that, we, that, that we even that's know it. Of. That's it. How many people around us probably know someone in a six-degree connection that this has happened to? Yeah, here's a classic example. Mm -hmm. I could, if I was with a bunch of family and friends that I knew really well, and I said, how many of you know a survivor of sexual assault? And half raised their hands. I probably know a survivor that the other half all know. Wow. Why? Because the difference is in my line of work, I'm more likely to have somebody feel safe and be able to talk with me than society says it's safer to talk to everyone else. And that doesn't mean I'm special. It just means my line of work, you're more likely to think, oh, they do that work. I can talk to them about that. And so that's more likely. And I always point that out. I'll say, how many of you in an audience know a survivor? I'm like 60% will raise their hand. And I go, was well, it just possible the other 40% you're not aware Sure. And when, you, and when you ask that, they're immediately going, oh, my gosh, that's so true. And here's why that's true to the workplace. People go, well, what's wrong if I say something totally inappropriate at the workplace? You don't know what harm's already been done to that person, first of all. Yeah. So they'll go, well, it's not my fault I'm triggering them. Yes, it is. You made the statement. You made an inappropriate statement in the workplace where it should not be made. Uh, and some people go, where should it be made? That's a different discussion. But in the workplace, we know it's not to be made there. You chose to. You caused this. You do have to own that. And you go, well, I don't know who has this done to me or hasn't had this done to me. That's right. So don't say it. Yeah, it, it's a common principle. You, you, you take people as you find them, right? We, they are how they are because of who they are. Just because you don't think that they're easily susceptible to being triggered doesn't mean that they aren't. And a lot of people don't share that kind of information because they shouldn't have to sometimes. Well, yeah, they shouldn't have to, right? That's not, I shouldn't have to tell you harm that was done to me. Yeah. Right. And what's interesting about that is they, they'll say, well, you know, I don't know who is or who isn't. It isn't your business. Who it's is? It doesn't matter. Who, it, that's right. And well, I mean, why don't they tell me that I won't say the wrong thing? Uh, how about just not saying the wrong thing? <laughs> like, how about, is this what I'm about to say out of my mouth? Could this do harm? If it could do harm, maybe I shouldn't say it. Now, let me be very clear. We all say things that do harm. The question is, when you're intentionally defying that guideline, that's a different, right? Where you go, well, that's not my fault there. That means you're intentionally saying, I don't care if I do harm to others. That's messed up. Right? It really to, is. We, and that's really where we have to stop and go, am I being aware? Look, I've said things in the past that, 
were more hurtful than I realized at the time. Uh, and that didn't make it okay because I didn't realize it, right? It meant that when I realized it was harmful, I needed to go back and go, that was messed up. That was, I have to own that. Uh, and I have to look in the mirror and go, what got me to that conversation in that place? So I don't do that again. And by the way, for some of us, I mean, I've had moments in my life where I got more rocked that, in that I did that than in other times. And it makes you look back on the last five, 10 years and going, ooh, how often have I done that? But that's how, that's how we talk about mindfulness. Am I aware of what I'm doing in the world and what my words and my actions, how it's impacting this culture? Whether it's workplace, home, friends. Well, I think some people don't realize the power that they have in what they oh say. Oh my gosh, yes. I agree with you. They think it's just words. I mean, what's whether, whether they put it out on social media or Instagram or, you know, saying it to a friend, they don't realize the power of what they've done or said and how many people it can affect. That's right. And when somebody says something's like, it's just words. Well, if they meant nothing, why'd you say them? It's a valid point. If they had no value, right? You're saying they have no value. They have no harm. They have no value. They, they can't do harm, so therefore they have no value. Then why'd you say them? Well, I was being funny. Oh, so the words had intention. Which you gives it value. Would give it value. So you, you're contradicting yourself. You just said words don't matter, but then you were saying them to be funny. So clearly they have value. So, and it's helping people understand that. And we don't want to beat up on someone, right? So if we're talking with someone, the last thing that I want to do is lecture someone in a moment like that, because they're not going to listen to that. And I wouldn't, if I'm on stage and I'm talking to 10,000 people in an audience or 5,000 people in an audience, the last thing I want to do is, is lecture the audience or in a person in the audience who says something that could be harmful. I want to engage that person. I want to say, well, that's interesting. What do you mean by that? I want to engage them so that we can have a learning opportunity. One, maybe I learn from what they actually meant versus what they said and I, my interpretation of it. So I want to engage for that reason. Two, by them explaining, they might catch themselves doing harm right there and go, whoa, I didn't mean it that way. That's messed up. And there's a learning opportunity versus a lecture with just barriers pop up and no one's listening. I mean, it's a very uh, interesting thing because it's not just words have power. And I don't think, I think people don't realize how powerful that is because you know, cyberbullying is a thing. Sexual assault is a thing. These things are, are there and they're existing. And people and what they say or do have an impact on that in both uh, positive and negative ways. And so my, what do you tell people who are like, I, you know, I'm not involved in that. I don't say anything wrong or I'm just, I don't hang with those kinds of people. It's not me. I'll give you a classic example of that. Uh, so I work and people ask, hey, do you ever work with people in a work environment? Absolutely. And one that I do the most, well, I, that I, that, that's really the one I work with is U.S. military. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're required to go to training on sexual assault and sexual violence. And somebody comes in the room and says, come on, I've been married 30 years. I don't go out to the bars. I do not need to be in this room. I don't need to be here. Mm -hmm. And you go, okay, all right, let's look at your life where it's at. So you've been married 30 years. Um, you don't go to the bars. Um, all right. Do you think that other people that have been married 30 years that don't go to bars, that they're out having a good time with friends and they might give their partner or encourage their partner to have a couple more drinks to help them have sex that night? And people go, well, of course, that's marriage. Is it? And suddenly you're into a great conversation. You've got to figure out where the commonality is no matter where somebody's coming in the room. So if somebody says, I've been married 30 years and I don't need to be in the room, and I know there's a good chance that at one time or another they might have used alcohol to get the sex they wanted from that person, who they've been married to, now we're on the same discussion as the 18-year-old who goes to the bar to use alcohol to try to get sex from someone. Mm -hmm. Wow! It's, I have to understand where they're coming from, though, to start that conversation. Well, I didn't even think about that. That's crazy. Right. And what's crazy is someone will sit here listening to this right now going, wait, 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 wait. Yes, I've used alcohol to get sex with my partner. Does that make me an assailant? Well, you just pause and ask why you're becoming so defensive when I use that example. Right. Because, because you're probably hearing, yes, I've done that. And when I really look in the mirror and look at myself, I know that's not the way my partner deserved for that to take place. I know that if my partner really wanted to be sexually intimate with me, they don't need an ounce of alcohol. They don't need it. That doesn't mean they can't have a drink and consent. The law says you need to be of sound mind, right? And so, or not incapacitated. So you can have a drink and give consent for most people could do that. Uh, and that's not what we're saying, but you're talking about where you gave them like two, three extra drinks to change their state of mind 
so they'd have sex with you because they wouldn't have it without that. How messed up is that? That's the person you love you're telling me. And that's where we have to figure out where are these places in society where we're all been taught these similar lessons that are messed up? And can we just acknowledge how messed they up are and then talk about what's a new way to do things going forward, whether the workplace, whether home? Wow. So that's that that's a, a married couple. What about parents? Parents who are worried for their child, their who they're bringing up in the world. You know, what do they what do you tell them? Well, there's a lot of, I mean, we have, that's a tough one. Cause, I mean, <laughs> yeah, we have a that one. program. Exactly. Right. So, I mean, we have a DVD just for parents on this discussion. So it's a matter of which element we want to discuss on parenting. Uh, the, here are some key things for parents. You have to ask yourself as a parent, am I giving my children skills to make better choices or am I trying to protect them from harm being done? If it's that I'm trying to protect them from harm being done, you're giving them nothing to do with. You're not giving them a skill set. You're just threatening them. Comments like this. Anybody ever touches you, I'll kill them. What good did that do? Well, it tells them I love them. Mm, it just scared them from ever telling you if somebody ever touches them. But well, it, what it did is it made you feel better that you let them know you're here for them. But they didn't hear it that way, so it actually did more harm than good. They say, well, what would be a better way? Well, how about you give them skills? And you say, look, when you're in a sexual situation with someone and you're of the right age and you're at the right place in your life, here's how you have conversations about sex. Here's how you talk about what you like, what you don't like. Here's how you discover what your partner likes and what they don't like. Here's how you make sure it's mutual. Here are the words that you're able to use. Give them a skill set that empowers them to be able to say, I'm not ready for this with a partner. I'm not ready for this. Or I am ready for this. Or are you ready? What would you love right now? Being able to talk and have a skill set gives them a voice which will help them protect themselves. Because there's nothing you can say that can guarantee the 100% safety of your child. Nothing. I know someone will say, well, I'll tell the partner they're out with. If you touch them, I'll kill you. You know what? You just made the partner they're out with really hate you. So why are they going to worry about what you think? And if they were already going to do harm to your kid, they don't care about you. So how about you instead engage that partner, become friends with them, because then at least they like you and they probably don't want to disappoint you because that's a human connection versus just a threatening connection. It sounds like what you're saying is you're helping parents make a safe space for or environment for their kids to come to them. Yes, at least attempt to, because we can't guarantee a safe space with kids. In other words, Anybody who has more than one child knows what I'm about to say is true. You could say the exact same thing to two different kids in your home that you raised with you know, the same partner, and they will hear it completely different, and it, they will process completely different uh, if they even allow you to have the conversation based on how they treat these situations. So the one thing we never tell parents is that I'm going to give you the end-all answer that will solve it all. No, but I'm gonna, what I will do is I'll give you a skill set. You can give all those four kids or all those two kids or all that one child – and at least even if they don't want to listen, they're hearing the words. On, on the basic level, they're hearing the words, and it's going somewhere in that brain for hopefully to be able to use down the road. Some of them are going to go, oh, I love this. This is great for me to use. Others are going to go, blah, 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 blah. I don't want to hear this, but they're still hearing it. And you're giving them a skill set that could help them. Mike, how did you learn about all this? Well, you mean as far as how did I learn about the the skill sets and how to engage? Yeah, I mean I – I'm sure you did research, but like, how much are we talking? And how do you do research on this? <laughs> well, in, and at the time, it was really hard to do research on this because there just wasn't as much out there. I mean, I started doing this work in 1990, 91. I was 20, 21 years old wow. when, I, when I started speaking out. And so, I, I, one, I came from a theater background. Uh, and so, getting up in front of a room and having a discussion was not scary per se by itself. Uh, and, but what I did have to learn over the years was the psychology of what you're asking right now. How do you learn what engages a teen? How do you learn what engages an adult? I mean, I w literally last week, one day I was in rural Wisconsin speaking to a high school. And the next day I was in Virginia speaking at, in Norfolk to our, to our Marines. Those are two very different audiences I'm walking in front of at that point. How do you know what works with what? Research is true and tons of experience. So the book out there called Tipping Point is based on 10,000 hours. After 10,000 hours of doing something over and over again, your brain naturally reacts to that moment and knows how to react without having to strategically think and make every choice. That's true in this line of work. 
So when people go, oh, geez, you know, consent has been the last year has become a hot topic. Wow. You, you've just really taken off the last year. We've been doing this work for 27 years. That's why that's why we're able to gain these skill sets and these insights on what works for each different group. So that's the difference. Right. If I'm in speaking to you right now, Amy, there's nothing that's probably going to be said that I haven't heard after 27 years. So it allows me to be very comfortable and naturally be in a place of just let's just chat. Versus, ooh, what's the right thing to say here? What's the wrong thing to say here? You're in a place of natural comfort after all these years of doing this work. And I think that goes back to the original question or one of the earlier questions that we had is, you know, is this something new or something you've seen? How has that changed over 27 years, this topic? I mean, it seems like you're still fighting the good fight and, you know, making headway, but, you know, there's always room and work to be done. But overall... Well, what are some th differences you've, you've seen as time has gone by? Here's a massive difference. The level of awareness is so much better today than it was 28 years ago. So much better. If you walk up to somebody and say, if somebody uses alcohol to get someone drunk to have sex with them, is that wrong? Almost everybody will say, of course that's wrong nowadays. 28 years ago, people go, well, they chose to drink the alcohol. And they blame the other per the person who was vulnerable instead of uh, because of being not a capacity, you know, not having full capacity instead of the person intentionally taking advantage of that power and sexually assaulting them. Now, today, here's the difference. Awareness is there. Can you consent when somebody is not capa at full capacity or not not of sound mind due to alcohol or drugs? Audience of all ages will go, of course, you can't. Here's the difference, though. We now have awareness. The next step is we need behavioral shift. Because that same audience will admit, but yes, I've done that before. So you know what's wrong, but you're, you're still engaging in the behavior. That's the shift that now needs to take place. And that's what we're focused on, giving people a skill set so they can totally transform their behavior, not just their understanding. We understand what sexual assault is. Most people do. They know it's wrong. Most people do. Now they need a skill set to transform culture so that they're not even close to that behavior at any time as far as their own choices and what they do to another person or with another person, even more important. Mike, how do you, how are you guys handling this? Like, is this, you know, it's hard to teach old dogs new tricks kind of a concept with the, and so you're trying to catch them when, when they're young or is this? So, yeah. well, I don't get that option, right? I yeah, get whenever they, true. I get whenever they bring me in, that's who I'm working with. Right. So if I get a middle school that hires me to have this conversation, awesome. And if I get a military where the average person in the audience of that day is 55 years old, still awesome. Cause it's never too late. It is never too late. Here's the key. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to have a conversation with that person, no matter where they are in their life, that it goes back to what I said earlier. You need to come where they're at. You need to understand their world. And how you do that is you ask people questions. I'm never going to walk in an audience and assume their answers. I'm going to walk in and say, let's have a conversation. They're going to reveal their world to me. And then I can put a mirror up and go, well, does that make sense? And they'll be like, well, not really. All right, well, how about if we made it made sense? And we had a place where that didn't have to be true just because that's the way it's been for the past 50 years. Mm. And they'll go, well, what's the option? And if you give them a realistic solution to move forward with, they want to do the right thing. People want to do the right thing. They just feel they don't have the skill set to do it. And that's where that's why we're doing the work we do to give them the skill set so they can make that shift, whether that's in the corporate environment, the school environment, the home environment. So, Mike, can you, can you talk a little bit about some of the skill sets that people that you're bringing to people for this? I mean, just for those who may not have read your book yet, what are some things they could keep in mind as they're having conversations and whatnot? So a great example is, I, I re quickly referenced it earlier, is asking for a kiss. People have all these stereotypes on how it's going to ruin the moment versus we'll actually give them the skill set of how to do it. That's one example. So in the book, we teach how to do that. Uh, when I'm doing a live training for an audience, we're teaching how to do that. And people go, okay, but I get asking for a kiss, but how do I ask for more than a kiss? You better believe I'm going to teach you how to do that. Because that's common sense the next step sooner or later. So that's, I mean, literally the skill set of how to look your partner in the eye and ask this question. And do it in a way that's sincere, it's powerful, it's passionate, and it's fun, it's playful, it's romantic, it's sexy. Having that conversation, that's on the personal life side. Now, in the corporate environment, the question would be, okay, uh, what's appropriate to, to talk about and what's not in a corporate setting? 
So for instance, is it appropriate to be sexualizing something in the workplace? No. So how do you avoid that? Well, here's how you could have that conversation that takes out the sexualization, right? And so giving people specific words and skill sets to use. What do you say, and this came to me as you were talking about um, different people, what do you say to those who, or what have you heard uh, people say to those are, is that something you would say to your mom? Or do you have sisters? Or, you know, even guys are uh, probably victim to, yeah, to sexual assault. Yeah, I used well, to, oh yeah, all genders, all genders are survived, mm-hmm. can be survivors of sexual assault. I used to make that mistake, so I understand it. I understand the well meaning behind the, you know, the intention of saying it. Mm-hmm. But it's not good. Here's why it's not good. And I used to make the mistake. The disaster is that only your family matters in that situation. Ah. Well, I have a daughter. So if you saw this in the past year, in the political situations, people are coming out going, I have daughters. I have wives. I would never want this said about them. How about just because they're human beings, we don't want it said about them? See, the moment I say, well, if that was my daughter, if that was my son, if that was my, it's about my, my, my. It's about the possessiveness of protecting my own. It's not about caring for all human beings. It minimizes it. It absolutely minimizes it. Mm -hmm. It's only important if it happens to my loved one or these people I care about versus that's never okay to any human being. That's the big shift. Instead of being about that's my loved one, how about that's a human being? And it could be a complete stranger. And here's the example I give to people. You're wired to do the right thing and care about every other human being. Anyone listening right now, you are wired to care for every other human being. You just go against it sometimes because that's what happens in our society. Expl- easiest way to explain it. You roll up on a car accident. It's a horrific car accident. You're the first one there and no one's coming. People say, well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to run out to help them or call for help. I said almost every time, right? They go, of course I would. Is it a dangerous situation? It could be. Uh, are they strangers? Yes. So you do care about everyone and you do want to do the right thing for every human being. That's the greatest example. You just got to remember, you got to remember that when you're at a club or at a bar and you see somebody doing something wrong that that person could, that what that person's about to attempt to do to another human being could be a horrific accident. You could actually stop before it happens. You could intervene or in the workplace where you see complete disregard, disrespect or sexual degradation to another person and you could actually speak out and do something about it. The difference is the car crash, the harm's already been done. You're trying to save more harm from being done. In the workplace, at home, with friends, you have the possibility to stop any more harm from being done or the harm getting worse right there on the spot or maybe any harm happening if you move quickly enough, you speak quickly enough. And that's, I think, uh, it's interesting. I'm glad you, you answered that because I don't think I realized about the minimization of saying, you know, just... If it was my mom, I wouldn't do that. But you're right. I mean, for a lot of things, we could say the same thing. What about the fact that they're a fellow human being? Culturally, right. religious, you know, if you take all of that stuff out, we're all the same when you bring it down to it, to, to the basics. And that's really an interesting thing. So, Mike, to, to kind of hopefully head towards a positive note, have you seen an improvement things? Absolutely. Absolutely. And here's why. When people, it goes back to what I just said. People want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. When you give them the skill set, they'll do it. It's just amazing how much people will do the right thing. And people go, well, Mike, how do you have proof of this? Well, one, we do survey our audiences afterwards. And to see the shift, they admit the drastic shift is incredible. Regardless of gender, by the way, like all genders, we see a consistent numbers. It's not separated by gender. I mean, it is separated by gender, so we can see that as far as audience will se- will separate themselves is what I mean by that. Uh, and we can, see- but the consistency is there, regardless of. Here's great evidence. Mm-hmm. We'll get people to come up to us and say, "Hey, I saw you 13 years ago on my college campus. I saw you 14 years ago in my high school. I saw you 12 years ago on a military installation, and I started using that skill set, and it's changed my marriage, my life." forever. And so that's where, that's why we do this work. Cause we get that. We get the people coming to us going, this shifted everything in my life in a positive way. So people say to me, Mike, you deal with such a topic that can seem so depressing. No, no, no. It's only when people don't have a skill set or people intentionally do harm to others that it becomes very depressing. What about all the times we have an opportunity to create a positive shift in this culture? That is uplifting. It is inspiring. It is motivating. It's like, raha, let's go, you know, woohoo, let's go. That's why we do the work we do. It's chasing the dream. We're focused on the dream. I love it. I love it. And I love what you're doing. And so, Mike, 
there are so many things you could say right now. I'm not even sure which one you'll pick. We usually wrap up the show with an action item. What is one action people today could take to help achieve their dreams, chase their dreams, or help make the world a better place? Ask for what you want and respect the answer. Find the people in your life that you, you're trying to pursue this dream, whatever it is. Go to them and ask, tell them your dream. Here's my dream. And ask them in ways they could support your dream. Could you support me in this way? And be as specific as possible. Can you support me in this way? And then respect their answer. If somebody says, I'm probably not good for that. Don't get mad. You asked in the first place. So don't get mad at them. They're being honest and say, I respect, I respect you gave that answer. Thank you. They might say, yes, I'll respect, I'll help you, blah, blah, blah. They might go, you know, I don't have a place in my life for that right now. Or I don't know that. Okay, good. That's why I asked. Respect the answer. That's the critical piece. I'm going to teach that whether I'm talking to somebody asking for a kiss, ask for the kiss, respect the answer. You want to pursue a dream in life? Ask people to support you and respect their answer. I love that. That's actually a very, I don't think anyone's given that take on it, but I think it's absolutely important to remember. Yeah, because you, what's amazing is if you're willing to ask, you might be shocked with the amazing experiences that could come into your life. Right. And I say it's the same thing when would you, you say, well, I can't ask that person out for a date. Well, then you'll never know what a date's like with them. Why not ask? What if they say yes? Right. So it's the same concept here. As long as you're respecting the answer, like you're not trying to, you know, pressure them into this situation. That's a different ballgame. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think that's a very good point about respecting the answer, because just because you're asking doesn't mean you're getting an automatic answer you want. And that's, that's right. Right. That's that's life in general as well. Just because. You should- you, yep, you say yep. sorry doesn't mean it's okay. You know, exactly. A lot of things. Well, Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show and, you know, bringing this uh, important topic to it so that we could talk about it and just kind of share your dream and how things are going. Well, thank you for having me on, Amy. This has been a great conversation. Hey, guys, that was Mike Domish, and he is doing the good work. All right. I think it's a very important topic. Hopefully you, you listened to the whole thing and hopefully you took something away from it. Please keep it in mind. It's not something we talk about, but is still very important just because we're not talking about it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Blinders doesn't count here. Okay. So keep that in mind and take his advice to heart, you know, ask the question and then respect the answer. That's important in anything you do, whether it's asking someone out for a date or asking for help with a project. Just because you're asking doesn't mean it's automatic yes or whatever answer you want. Okay, you got to respect the answer as well. So guys, take all of that. And remember, you can find all the notes and information about Mike over on the show notes page at ChasingDreamsHQ.com slash episode 89. That's episode 89. Until next time, guys, keep chasing. Thank you so much for listening to Chasing Dreams. Amy would love to connect with you and hear all about your pursuit of chasing your dreams. Connect with her on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram via at Chasing Dreams HQ. Or you can find Amy on Twitter at AmyJ21. That's A-I-M-E-E-J-2-1. Be sure to visit headquarters over at ChasingDreamsHQ.com for more inspiration, motivation, and resources to help with your own dream chase. We hope you'll join Amy next week. And until then, keep chasing.